I know, Richie, this is one of your areas of research is resilience. I mean, actually trying to figure out what's happening in the brain so that people can be resilient. Have, have you figured this out? Well, what, one specific um, example is the following. One, uh, one way that we get ourselves into trouble sometimes is um, by perseverating over um, adversity. And so if something, if we're uh, confronted with a stress, uh, we often have an emotional reaction that perseverates, that uh, uh, just goes on beyond the point where it's useful and uh, goes on beyond the point where the stress is actually present. And one of the things that we find in the brain is that's expressed in prolonged activation in a particular part of the brain called the amygdala, which is very important for emotion and particularly for stress and negative emotions and anxiety. And so we've actually been able to measure the duration of time that the amygdala responds to a particular discrete emotional stimulus that we can present in the laboratory. And one of the things that we found is that practicing mindfulness will uh, actually lead to faster recovery in the amygdala. The amygdala comes back down to baseline more quickly. So uh, there's a response. It doesn't change the response itself, but what it does seem to do is it changes how quickly you recover. Uh, and that may be a key attribute of resilience. And is this a long-term thing? I mean, sort of the, the more practice you have in mindfulness, the more resilient you naturally are? Our data do indicate that there is, in fact, a correlation between um, the number of hours of formal practice uh, and um, the rapidity with which the amygdala recovers in, in this particular way. Yeah. John? And part of it is uh, to bring together some of what Richie and Amishi is saying, that um, if you take depression, for instance, uh, major depressive disorder or, you know, just one of the most uh, painful aspects of it is that the mind just keeps going over the same thing over and over and over again, the perseveration you were talking about. And you also believe the thoughts that your mind is secreting as the truth. You have no separation from them as these are events in the field of awareness. They're events in the field of consciousness. But no, it's the truth. I'm a terrible person. I've always been a, I'm a failure. I'm too old. I'm too this. I'm too that. And we just believe that is the truth. When you cultivate mindfulness, what you're doing is you're adding another dimension for the picture. You're not trying to fix that or not trying to fix anything or make anything go away. So in that sense, it's a very radical stance to take. What you're doing is expanding the field of awareness to hold your observing capacity as separate from what it is that's being observed. And then <clears throat> one kind of uh, quick way to frame it is that uh, when you see that you're not your thoughts or your emotions, then you have a whole palette of different ways to be in relationship to those thoughts or emotions. And that can break this vicious, vicious cycle of depressive rumination. And all of a sudden, and this shows itself in different areas of the brain. When people are trained in MBSR, mindfulness-based stress reduction, um, before they're trained, there tends to be a lot of activity in what's called the default network, as I understand it, where, you know, just, it's, it's a narrative network about the story of me. And if the story of me is particularly depressing, well, it's an awful lot like that. Then when you train people in mindfulness, another lateral network shows up. It's not that this shuts down, but it does decrease. And that is a kind of non-narrative self-referencing. It's just... I'm here now feeling my breath, feeling the body, standing, the air on my skin or whatever. And, and that's, and it's related to different parts of the brain. Um, and uh, that seems to give you a whole other way to be in relationship to the thinking part. Now, there's nothing wrong with thinking. But when thinking takes over and dominates our lives and we become, as I said, lost in thought or completely oppressed by thought, then we're oppressed. We're not free. And this gives us, uh, this cultivation of mindfulness gives us a whole other dimension to be in wiser relationship to it. But this is sort of fascinating. I mean, you're, you're suggesting that to be truly mindful, we have to kind of get rid of the story 
that we tell them. No, no, not get rid of it. No, the languaging becomes very, very important here. It's not about getting rid of anything. It's more about cultivating different innate aspects of ourselves by, as Richie was saying, becoming more familiar with the territory. We're familiaring ourselves, ourselves with the territory. It's as if we only shine the spotlight over here mm -hmm. in a territory that's got at least five or ten different dimensions. So when we tune into these different dimensions through the senses, through awareness itself, then we've got a whole way of being in relationship to thinking and to the narrative that is liberating, it's freeing. And here's the kind of take home message is <clears throat> if you want to reduce the stress in your life, um, then be aware of how much you tend to take personally things that actually aren't personal. Okay? Um, we make them personal by our story of them, but actually it may just be the human condition, it may be life expressing itself, but if we create a big story of me, that big story of me, we may wind up being the first victims of it, so to speak, in believing it, even though, and it can be all true in one way, but it's just not a big enough story. Mm -hmm. And so what this is about, in some sense, is expanding the awareness and the narrative so that, you know, if you've meditated for 50,000 hours or something like that, how you are in relationship to your life is very different from if you've been meditating for a week and a half.